This is the Writer's Mindset Podcast. Formerly called the Writer's Cookbook Podcast. With me, Christina Adams. And me, Ellie Butts. We're here to inspire and motivate you to overcome the roadblocks holding you back in your writing career. With some tough love, some hard truths and serious reality checks. Let's get started. You can support The Writer's Mindset over on Patreon for less than your favourite coffee a month. If you join our community, you'll get access to bonus episodes, exclusive discounts, and much more. And we'll be eternally grateful for your support. Yes, as will Frankie and Millie for the extra pet treats we'll be able to get for them. To join our community and find out more, visit writerscookbook.com forward slash support. So how's your writing been going this week? I've had quite a productive week. Um, more planning than writing, I will say that, though I have done some writing. I got a lot of feedback through from my dissertation piece that I'm working on, and it gave me so many ideas for bits and pieces that I can include, extra scenes, extra bits where characters need developing, etc. And it just generally made me more excited to work on the project. So I've got a long list of things to do, um, but in the, in the best possible way. Put it that way. What about you? What have you been up to? I'm so close now with the ghost call. It feels really good. A lot of the issues now are from where I've rewritten sections and they're not rewritten, kind of the foreshadowing or the consequences. And it's probably a case of most of the stuff that needs tweaking now is only like a paragraph or two. It's not whole sections. And the feedback I've had on the new version has been really positive as well. So I'm really, really excited. But I also kind of just want to finish it at the same time. You should be excited. It's an exciting project. Thank you. You are most welcome. This episode, we are talking about ways to combat perfectionism and anxiety around writing your first draft. So perfectionism tends to manifest as not feeling good enough or the need to feel flawless. That includes harsh self-commentary and worry about feedback from others and often comes with unachievable or unrealistic goals. It can then lead to procrastination or giving up altogether. Long term, it can cause or exacerbate depression and anxiety and can even affect relationships and health. Yeah, perfectionism is a lot more common than we think, but I've seen it confused with striving to improve or better yourself. And when you're trying to improve, it's about keeping an open mind and wanting to live your best life and providing the best service to your readers or clients. It's got nothing to do with this voice in your head saying, you suck, you suck, give up. It's easy to confuse the two, I think. Why is perfectionism specifically so detrimental to getting those first drafts done then? Because you're immediately telling yourself this first draft isn't good enough before you even had a chance to prove yourself wrong. But then it goes further than that. It's not just about one book or an idea. It's saying that you yourself are not good enough as a person. And that has a really significant impact on how you live your life. As we all know, though, the first draft is not supposed to be perfect. Harry Pratchett is one of the few people to have said the first draft is just there to tell yourself the story, right? Yeah, and they're often the hardest part and where a lot of writers get stuck. But if you can finish your first draft you're already ahead of most writers because most writers never finish a book. Heck, some never even finish planning it because they get so caught up in the world building and the characterization. It really doesn't matter if your first draft isn't suitable for other people to read. It's not meant to be, right? Your first draft, once it's finished, is kind of like standing in a room in just your underwear. Your outfit isn't finished yet. So why are you showing it to people? You want them to judge the finished piece when it's as polished as it can possibly be because then when you do have something to show people they can go oh maybe you need an accessory here or maybe you need a different color top and that's the kind of feedback that is beneficial not someone saying seeing you in your underwear and picking fault out of the shape of your body your first draft is supposed to be a starting point for you to improve on that makes sense i mean most people would not be comfortable showing everyone their underwear which is perfectly fine why do you compare showing people your first draft to that though 
Because it's not ready yet, and it shouldn't be. It is the essentials of what you need. It is the framework. It is your scaffolding. You want to worry about the snappy language and making it sound really clever and whatever? Later. That's what editing is for. The sooner you get the idea out of your head, the sooner you can quiet those voices and get closer to finishing your book. My first drafts are often missing massive chunks because the first draft is me just getting the main plot down. When I do developmental editing, it often tends to add 30 or 40,000 because that's when I fill in the gaps and add in the subplots. The first draft of The Ghost's Call was about 25,000 words and it's now up to 60,000. Hollywood Destiny's first draft was 37,000 and now it's 70,000 words. So this whole thing of a first draft needing to be a complete story is utter bollocks. It sounds like it and you've got the stats to prove it there as well. You said at the start that people confuse striving to improve themselves with perfectionism. Now, I don't class myself as a perfectionist, but I do know that there are always ways I can improve my work and I try to work towards that as much as possible. That's a key facet to being a writer, in my opinion, working on your skill and honing your craft. And to be honest with you, learning that writing is a skill that you can learn and improve on was game changing for me. I, I knew how to learn things <laughs> and so having that mindset made me more confident in approaching writing and being open to improving myself. And I've been honing my skills for a few years now. I have come a long way from where I used to be. <laughs> I think your open mindedness is a big part of that because you're always asking for feedback you're always looking for ways to learn and you have a healthy attitude to wanting to improve and it's not rooted in not feeling good enough it's just knowing that you can be better and you want to be able to compete with everything that's out there and always looking to improve and challenge yourself is a really invaluable skill But it's also a mindset thing of it's not that you don't feel good enough. It's just that you want to push yourself. You want to grow as a person. And yes, that will come naturally as you do something more often. But if you're actively seeking to improve, you will get better much faster. Whereas when it comes to perfectionism, it stops you from finishing things because you can't be objective about your own progress or product. How can we pull ourselves out of that, though? If we're stuck in that rut, what can we do to I and mean, escape that negative point of view. It really helps to focus on other people's perspectives, not yours. And also think about will the end result compete with what's out there? It matters if it can compete, not with what do you think and what's going on right now and that's sometimes why seeing the bigger picture and planning for the bigger picture can help, but then writing for the smaller one. You also want to make sure that you're getting feedback from people who know your genre and also care about you. You want people who will give positive and negative feedback. And most people who are trained to edit will only focus on what is wrong with your manuscript. You know, I was trained that way as well. But I love the way Alexa Whitewolf, my editor, does things because she also comments on the positive. And that is not only, you know, a confidence builder, but it also helps that you don't then accidentally change something that's working really well. Because sometimes that can be a consequence of fixing something negative is you then accidentally fix what isn't broken. So if you know something already works, but then maybe the next bit of it doesn't, you can try and balance the two out. Knowing your genre conventions is really helpful as well, because if you've factored those in mind when you're planning, you don't necessarily need to consider them as much then when you're writing and editing. They're just kind of there in the back of your head. If you train your brain to be objective as well, so you're focusing on not your thoughts, but on, okay, does this fit the genre? Is this a good story? How does it compare to the hero's journey or the snowflake method or whatever structure you're using? Not necessarily other people's writing, but the structure and maybe some guides on characterization like mine on how to write believable characters or on um, some of Sasha Black's books on writing craft. If you can compare it to that kind of evidence rather than just the voices in your head, you've got something much more concrete and with actual proof and a basis to go, yeah, okay, I need to fix this or no, that's already really good and I'm judging it too harshly because I did it. And the other thing to keep in mind is that when you feel really stuck on something. You're like, I don't know what I should do with my book, so I'm just going to stop. Or you don't know, or maybe you're pitching. Maybe you want to publish traditionally and you're afraid of that. Remember that a no from an agent 
or the wrong answer to fixing your plot, although there's no wrong answer with it, is still a step forward. Whereas being stuck in limbo is no way to live. It destroys you and it stops you from progressing. And the longer you are stuck in limbo, the more it will hold you back. And I don't want you to live your life with regrets or feeling like you are not good enough. That's really powerful. Thank you for that. We do have a couple of tips here when it comes to combating perfectionism and first draft. Shall we alternate those? Do you want to go first? Yeah. So this is one that I've actually had issues with before, which is rumination. Oh, we just discussed it a little bit, which is pulling yourself out by thinking of other people. So rather than this voice in your head going, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough, give yourself concrete stories involving other people that contradict it. Maybe you've got some friends that are really supportive. Maybe you won a poetry contest at school. Maybe you've had a positive review on something you've written before. Our next tip is gratitude. So instead of focusing on the voice that's telling you not good enough, focus on what you are grateful for. Studies have proven that this helps to change your perspective. Optimistic people also live longer. Instead of focusing on, I can't do this or I'm not good enough, focus on, actually, I'm really good at this and I'm grateful for that and I'm grateful for the ability to write and I'm grateful, etc., etc. The other thing is to be objective. Remember what's going on in your head is just an opinion. It's not necessarily even your opinion. It is your anxiety's opinion. Other people who read your work in progress will feel differently. And, you know, there will be some people who don't like it, but then those people who dislike it aren't your target audience. You want those people who feel really passionate about what you write because they are the ones who will become your advanced readers. They will spread the word about your books. They will buy everything that you sell and they will be on your side there's people who leave the negative reviews a are probably projecting their bad mood onto you but b we're never going to be on your side to begin with that's a very good point point. and then lastly something i mentioned a little bit earlier was breaking it down into smaller chunks so instead of thinking i have to write an entire book if that makes you feel overwhelmed break it down break it down say i have to write this one chapter or i have to write this one scene or even this one paragraph if that's how far you need to break it down and Make sure you are rewarding yourself afterwards. Yeah, never forget your award. It's really important because it will train your brain to associate this thing that you're scared of or that you're punishing yourself with almost is um, then associated with something more positive. And over time, it retrains your brain and builds the happy chemicals. And frankly, we all need more cookies and gaming in our life. Amen to that. To sum up then, don't listen to the voices in your head that are telling you you are not good enough. You are good enough, and if you persevere, you can get there. Yes, indeed. Now it is time for our book of the week. Book of the week. (laughs) This week, it's my pick, which is Perks of Being a Wallflower by Stephen Chomsky. I really should have looked up the pronunciation of his name before. I think that sounds right. That sounds good. And he actually did um, unusually write and direct the film as well. But the book is so much more in depth than the film. And it's weird. I find it a comfort read, but it does talk about some quite difficult topics. And it's a very short book, but it's powerful. And you really feel for Charlie and his layered emotions about what has happened to him. And if you are considering writing about mental health, I would really recommend reading The Perks of Being a Wallflower. And I emphasize reading, not watching, because of the extra depth that it goes into compared to the film. And also because of the language usage usage as well. You want to um, analyze that. So one of our patrons, Mary Beth Bretzlauf, has nominated To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. Mary Beth says, To Kill a Mockingbird is still a story I credit with wanting to write in my high school years. I've read the book so many times, but even now, I still discover new things. Did you know in the book, the dog with rabies has a last name, for instance? It was the name of his human, Johnson. I think that's important to know that even though you've read the book so many times, you can still get something from it, right? I have books like that for sure. Oh, yeah, definitely. And it's also the kind of mindset you're in when you read a book will affect your perspective of what you read as well. And that's something I never really considered until I reread Gone Girl and I reread Perks and also Vampire Academy, because I don't reread books very often. But you do notice different things depending on where you're at in your life and frankly, how much you've studied writing as well. 
Yeah, there are certain books, and I think TV shows and films as well, where you rewatch them when you're going through a different period of your life and you approach so many of the issues from a different perspective. Sometimes a more mature perspective, sometimes a more relatable perspective, but you can get more out of them sometimes. Different storylines that perhaps you didn't before when you reread them or revisit them. Yeah, and also when you're analysing them as well, not necessarily consciously analysing them. But I'm reading a book on negotiating at the moment and I've been re-watching Scandal and I can see Olivia Pope and the Gladiators using those negotiating tactics and it almost helps to contextualise the techniques because even though it's a work of fiction, I can see how they would work in real life and also why they work and it gives a whole new dimension to this series that I started watching whenever it first aired. Reading the book on negotiating tactics sounds like it's framing your whole outlook then which is not a bad thing but you you bear it in mind don't you even if you're not meaning to it's going to be in the back of your mind. Exactly and I think that's true of any book that you read but particularly if it's a non-fiction book about approaching something in your life differently you will then start to notice it it's like when you study the three act structure you then notice it everywhere the same with the hero's journey and then you just can't read a book the same way ever again because you're looking for things and like even my boyfriend and i were playing it takes two which is a two-player game a few weeks ago and he was like oh i think we're about halfway through i'm like i know i can tell by the way the story's going (laughs) that's quite impressive that you can even recognize it in games as well though It's everywhere. It is everywhere once you know it. And it's sometimes used differently. Like some TV shows will do one journey per episode, some will do it one per series, but those structures are nearly always there. Very useful information. Thanks for joining us. If something we have said has resonated with you, don't feel alone in your thoughts or questions. Come hang out in our free Facebook group. It's a safe place to talk all things writing, mental health, and publishing. You can check it out at writerscookbook.com forward slash Facebook group. And if you want to hear more from us, don't forget to tap that shiny, shiny subscribe button so that you never miss an episode. To support the podcast's future so that we can help more writers overcome their creative roadblocks and achieve or even exceed their writing goals, you can support us on Patreon for less than a coffee a month. And for that total bargain price, you'll get to request podcast topics and submit your book of the week, nab exclusive discounts on writing courses and get to listen to bonus episodes. That is a lot. Visit writerscookbook.com forward slash support if you want to find out more. See you next time.